Okay. So Matt, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Can you, first of all, because we're going to be speaking to a lot of CrossFit athletes, functional athletes in this, describe your background in training and competition and kind of how you got to where you are with just the athletic side of things. And we'll get into coaching in a, in a little while. Sure. So uh, I'm an endurance guy through and through. I started running when I was 11 years old, influenced by my father, who was running marathons back in the 1980s. Um, I played other sports when I was young, but I wasn't good at them. <laughs> um, and I bl actually blew out my knee uh, playing football, what we call soccer, um, uh, when I was 14. And uh, that sort of just, it was sort of a blessing in disguise. Um, you know, I just gave up anything requiring coordination after that and, and just have been um, a runner and ever since got into triathlons as well uh, in my late 20s. I'm, I'm 50 now and too old to learn any new tricks. <laughs> and how, what did you do to your knee, Matt? Um, it was an ACL tear. So yeah, this is back, uh, you know, I was 14. I, I didn't know what an ACL was. I mean, that's, that's pretty young to have that type yeah, I was about of injury. To say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how did that affect your training at that time? And obviously you, you changed sport. Like, what was that like dealing with that at 14? Because like you said, it's a pretty rare injury for a 14 year old. Yes. Um, you know, in, in those days, um, you know, you know, the, the surgery, surgery hasn't really changed much since then, but the rehab has changed a lot. You know, I spent six weeks after the operation in a rigid cast. Um, and by, yeah, by the time I got out of it, I, I mean, I was always a skinny kid, but my, my leg was so atrophied. It just looked like, like, um, you know, skin over bone, like a napkin draped over a rod. It was just, it was actually just disgusting to, to look at. And then, you know, I was in a, a full leg brace for, I want to say six months af after that. I remember, um, so part, you know, it's part of the rehab, you know, I, I started, um, high school and we had an indoor track season and I, I have old photos of myself running all these 1500 meter races with this full leg brace on and it just gave me a great excuse for finishing way way back um so yeah but when that came off um it, that, the following spring and I was finally able to run unfettered I felt like I had superpowers <laughs> yeah it must have always been like that moment in Forrest Gump when he breaks through right, exactly and it's like, oh yes. yeah I can do this <laughs> keep him running um, yeah, my, my fiance is going through ACL re like recovery from surgery at the moment, and it's a completely different process. I mean, she did hers 18 months ago, and then she only recently had surgery um, because, like, fingers crossed it'll be okay. But it's, um, right. yeah, that's crazy different surgery and crazy different rehab um, from that. Did you go through the, the surgery option? I did, yeah, because I, um, well, you know, the, I, I want to say that, um, you know, arthroscopic surgery was pretty new then. We're talking 1986-ish. Um, and so they, you know, they just went in, it was sort of exploratory. The surgeon explained, you know, we're going to go in there, see what's wrong, and if there's something obvious, uh, fix it. And what they found was that I had completely severed the, the, the tendon. But there was no surrounding damage, which is really unusual really because the, AC, the ACL is deep inside the knee. And usually if you have a third degree tear, you've messed up a bunch of other stuff too. So it was kind of fortunate in that regard. He just, you know, stretched a taut, stapled it. And uh, a year Super. later, I was good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Super impressive. Um, what came first for you? in terms of um, awareness? Was it coaching people or was it the mental aspect of sport or was it like a combination? Definitely the mental aspect. Um, you know, I had, I had kind of a, an awakening that I remember very, very clearly when I was uh, in the fifth grade here. So um, uh, 10, 11 years old. Yeah. Um, we had something called field day. It was like, you know, school Olympics where you know, all kinds of different little games and competitions you could participate in. And I signed up for whatever the longest race was. It was like four laps around a soccer pitch. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, every kid likes to run and likes to race, but, but children do not try to run far at speed, you know? So, um, so it's just a completely different 
type of suffering that you experience when you try to run fast and then sustain, you know, a, a high rate of speed. Um, and, you know, that was just a new experience for me. And I just remember thinking like, oh my God, I'm dying. Like, this is like, what is happening to my body? Just, you know, that, that like raw scraping feeling in your esophagus and that lactic acid burn in your legs. And it, that was, I had never, you know, felt those things before. And it does feel, it, you know, after years and years of doing it, you get so used to it, but you, it, it's really intense. You know, it's like a, a, a very, you know, it's a kind of pain really. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, what, what, in, what motivated me to put up with it was that uh, there was only one kid in front of me in, in this race. So I had a chance to win. So I had that carrot out there. Um, and I did end up winning the, the race. And afterward, you know, my, my assessment was that I had won the race, not necessarily because of anything physical, but because I had just embraced the suffering. I, I decided to accept it. And I sort of never changed my mind about that. You know, it just, I always felt like the, uh, you know, the, the real secret to succeeding as any type of an endurance athlete, or, or I, honestly, in any sport where you have to put up with high levels of fatigue um, is, you know, it's, it's, it's highly mental, at least half. <laughs> So obviously a lot of what creates our mentality, well, it's, I suppose it's half nature, half nurture. What happened in the nurture front to ensure that you were someone who went, I actually know I'm going to embrace this, this discomfort and kind of, and go forwards regardless. Like, was there any role models in your life? You like, displayed that? Well, yeah, my dad for, for sure. Um, yeah. My, my dad is uh, uh, a unique person. <laughs> yeah. He would do these, um, you know, he had a really tough relationship with his father growing up. So he had that kind of dynamic where he was always trying to prove himself. And that's a powerful motivator for, you know, boys and, and young men. And so he would do, he grew up on the St. Lawrence River and, and, you know, kind of on the Canadian border. And he, he, he was in the water all the time and he would do these solo long distance swims. And this is like, you know, back in the early 60s when it wasn't really a thing like he he did he certainly didn't know of anyone who did something like this he would just like plan a route like I'm going to swim across Lake Ontario and then he would just go out and do it like with someone like tagging along in a fishing boat just to make sure he didn't drown or whatever and uh and, you know this is like you know cold cold water you know sometimes in the water for 24 30 hours um, he finished one, finished one swim with a collapsed lung and hyp, hyp, hypothermia. I remember that it just had to drag him out of the water. Um, he had one or two attempts that were unsuccessful, but thank goodness for the fishing boat. And then from there, he, he joined the Navy. This is during the Vietnam era and, um, you know, became one of the, they call them Navy SEALs now. They were called frogmen back then. So, you know, special forces operator trained to actually deploy atomic bombs underwater on his back. <laughs> Pretty cool job. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just like, yeah, just like, um, yeah, just kind of a hardcore guy. And then, then he got into marathons. And so he was my role model. But, but funny enough, like, as it turned out, so yeah, that one race and you know, when I was, 10, 11 years old, I sort of embraced the suck. But later on, when I ran in high school, I became kind of a head case where I actually developed a strong aversion to the suffering I experienced in races. What I found was like, I had a little bit of talent for running. So for a while I could get faster and kind of climb up the ranks um, just by virtue of that. You know, I was, I was training, I was maturing, but then I got to the point where I was one of a handful of of kids in my state who are capable of winning individual state titles. And to make that last step, I discovered that I couldn't just rely on being more talented or, um, you know, just the natural maturation process. I had to be willing to dig deeper and, you know, go further into the pain cave. And it just got in my head. I, 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 I couldn't make that leap. I, I would have these experiences where, you know, I would be running head to head with some other kid down the home stretch you know, one, one of the other of us was going to win the race. And I could just feel that the other kid wanted it more than, than I did. And I, and I would blank. Um, and I ended up just burning out on the sport and quitting 
quitting for a while. I stopped running for a while. Yeah, I know it's um, thinking back a few decades, but do you remember what your thoughts were like at those kind of races when you're presented with that opportunity of like, okay, there's one guy that I feel wants it more. Like, what was it like to be in your head at that point? It, it, it would just, um, it, it would just like, you know, it was, it was like, it was as if my soul were saying no, just like, just, just no, I don't want, I don't want this. So it was just like, you know, and, and you still have that voice, that voice never goes away, but mm. it's just like, at that point I had no answer to it. It just, it just had control. Um, so it was just like this deafening no that I heeded uh, cause I, I just didn't have the tools um, to shout it down. <laughs> nice. That's, that's um, really interesting. Again, like, I think you're, you're obviously coming at this from what I would consider the appropriate angle, which is like, you never get rid of that voice. So many people think like, okay, I've, I've, I'm presented with this, this part of me that just wants to take the easy option, just wants to um, like give in and is happy coming second. It's happy pulling out. It's happy like using an excuse or finding an excuse. Um, and like the, the truth is that you don't, you don't ever tame it even like you just kind of, you learn to reply and have a conversation with it and learn to kind of, almost dominate it or, or speak over it. Um, when did you start developing that toolkit? When did you start developing some control over it? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, you know, I, so I quit running when I was 17, about to turn 18. And I thought I would never run again. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, uh, <laughs> a few years go by and, um, I had, I had grown up wanting to be a professional writer and the way things turned out shortly after I graduated from uni, I got a job with a startup endurance sports magazine. So at that time I was 24 years old, uh, overweight, out of shape, you know, I lifted some weights, but I just was not, you know, I would climb up a flight of stairs and get winded, you know, I was, <laughs> but you know, being back in that environment, just surrounded by athletes, um, kind of, you know, it, it, uh, you know, it, it found those smoldering embers of that passion for, you know, running and, and other ways of testing my body physically. Um, and it, it, it was a slow process. It didn't happen all at once, but I just got tempted back in. And it's a slippery slope, right? You know, a little, if a little is good, more is better. Um, and what, you know, when I got to the point in, in my late twenties, when, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to finish some unfinished business as an athlete, um, you know, part of me just wanted to, you know, cause I had friends who, who had, hadn't stopped running. They, they ran in college and, and I looked at them and thought, you know, what might have been. And, and so I wanted to realize my, my unrealized potential, but I also wanted to get that monkey off my back. Uh, like I, I saw myself as a coward at the time I quit running. I just kind of looked at myself in the mirror and said, you are a weak man. Like you you are a mental weakling. And I did not like seeing myself that way. So a big part of my, of the project of my, you know, the second act of my career as, as an athlete was changing how I saw myself like as a man, not just as, as an athlete. And I, I saw the two things going hand in hand. I, I knew that I couldn't fulfill 100% of my potential unless I took that step mentally. I'm going to come back to that in just a second, but before I forget, like when, what was happening when you're like 17 or what else in your life was happening when you're like 17 or so? And I'll, I'll give you like the background of my my reasoning to ask that because when I was 13, 14, I was a very, very good athlete. Like say football, soccer, like I was doing really well at like hitting some good levels and very competitive in any sport that I kind of turned my hand to. And then I started getting bullied at school and I was just having a terrible time. Um, I developed like pretty overwhelming anxiety um which in retrospect i believe contributed to a heart condition and like it showed up in the physical realm um and i that was when my mentality around training kind of faded and i became a, a kind of a very similar way like a, a weak like i saw myself as a weak individual as a coward as someone that was not strong um and that bled into everything and it only took some fortune and some good luck and um finding the slippery slope of the royal marines and going down that route to kind of go okay right i've got a challenge and a gauntlet now to come out of it but was there anything that was happening for you around that kind of 16 17 age that was affecting your mentality yeah you know, i think it was almost the opposite of your experience in my case where like i had you know 
I, I didn't have a bad relationship with my father. I had a great relationship with, with both of my parents, you know, so I had kind of a, a charmed childhood without a lot of deprivation or suffering or difficulty. You know, everything was easy. Like I didn't have a lot of trauma, nothing to kind of toughen me up. And I think, you know, I, I wouldn't wish it any other way, right? <laughs> like you can't wish trauma upon yourself. But I think I, I was just a little bit soft because I'd had a great childhood. So I just didn't, I didn't have, I hadn't developed those tools really. Um, so I think that's the kind of, kind of the way I look at it. The thing I didn't realize until much later was that there were plenty of kids that I was running against who were just as soft as I was. The difference was that it didn't sit well with me. So, you know, there were some, some other kids who, who would only give 90% in a race and it wouldn't bother them afterwards. And I didn't, and that, that's the thing I didn't give myself credit for was that like, at least it bothered me, mm. you know? So I think that that's kind of the nature side. Um, it was, it was, I, I think I, I had, I was born with what it takes to be mentally tough, but, but it, that's, that's not enough for anyone. <laughs> you mm. know, you have, you have to hone it. Um, so it just, it just, because of the nature of my charmed childhood, I think it, it took me a while um, to hone it. Yeah, a personal question, and like, feel free to skip this if you want. Do you have kids? No, I don't. Okay, all right. Like, what would you say to someone who's like considering that balance of, um, okay, how do I give people that I'm looking after and guiding the right amount of challenge and hardship? Yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about sports, you know, is that, um, you know, in a, another book I wrote called How Bad You Want It, um, I, there's a chapter where I focus on the cyclist Cadell Evans, um, who uh, he has the record for um, no one has ever won the Tour de France after losing it as many times as Cadell did. So he, he was Australian. He was one of these people who was just born with every advantage. Like, you know, when he was submitted to, you know, physiological testing as a teenager, he just destroyed Lance Armstrong's numbers. And he was, he was one of those, he was the golden child. He was destined for greatness from the very beginning. And everything came easily uh, to him. And he got to the point where he shows up at the Tour de France and he's the golden child and it's inevitable he's gonna win it and he loses. And he comes back, but he does well and he's young and he's got time, but then he comes back the next year. He does a little better, but he doesn't win again. And then year goes, you know, year after year, he has misset, mishaps you know, things don't go his way. And then suddenly he's not the young golden child anymore. He's getting a bit long in the tooth and, and he's, he's starting to go backwards. He's no longer even climbing the ladder. He's just going down again. And, and but then in his, I think, seventh try at the Tour de France, uh, he won it. And, and the, the thing I, I the, kind of the message of that chapter of the book is that the, 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 the one thing that he was missing was, um, that kind of sweet disgust that comes from being sick and tired of failing. Um, and so he hadn't gotten that in his everyday life. Like he, he just hadn't gotten to the point where he was just like getting bullied by whatever, you know, by whatever it was in, in life. And so it got, he, he just had to fail a bunch and, and, and get to the point where he was just like utterly determined to find a way. Um, so you know, so that, that's the great thing about sports. And if I were a parent, I would, I would, you know, I would want to make, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to introduce a child to trauma just for its own sake, mm -hmm. but I, I would count on sports to kind of take care of that um, and just be kind of hands off and just focus on nurturing and enjoyment for the sport itself. You know, let, let the kid decide how competitive he or she wants to be. And if they do decide that they want to be competitive and they have a passion for the sport, it's only a matter of time before they get injured or they lose or, you know, whatever it takes, you know. Yeah, it's almost like we need some adversity to hone ourselves against, to sharpen that blade a little bit and to kind of, to take us out of that. I suppose childhood into, into well, in my case, into manhood was, was what I needed. Adulthood is like, I, it was like, like I needed that in order to get rid of those old belief systems. When you were going through that system of like, okay, I'm, I'm channel, you, you said the phrase changing how you saw yourself. Where did you start with that? You know, early on, it's not, you know, in looking back, it's easy to 
make it seem like I had a plan. I, I didn't really <laughs> have a plan. I just, um, I get, you know, the main thing was that I just, um, you know, I, I wanted to expose myself to suffering and, and not blink. Um, and so some, one of the things I did would, would um, I, I would do some races where my, my primary goal was not the usual, like, they weren't performance goals. It, it, like I, I would have them, but they weren't my main goal. Um, so I, you know, normally it's like, I want to run a certain time or I want to finish in a certain place. Um, I would go into races where my goal was to see how much I could suffer to like, I, I wanted to finish the race and look back and say, I left absolutely everything I had to give out there on the race course. And that was, that would be the only standard I would, I would judge myself by. Um, and it really didn't happen all at once. You know, I just, it just took a lot of repetition where I, I would discover, you know what, that didn't kill me. You know, mm -hmm. Maybe I can push a little bit harder next time. What will happen to your results at the time? What happened to the tangible kind of um, measurable aspects of that? You, you know, funny enough, like I, um, you know, it, it didn't take very long to sort of shake off the rust, lose a bunch of weight, you know, get fit and, and start, you know, just, and, get right back on that path of improvement that I remembered from when I was a teenager. But then I kind of plateaued for a while, honestly. And I started to wonder like, what the heck is wrong with me? Like I, you know, cause when I was a kid, you know, I was never going to the Olympics, but you know, I was on a path toward, you know, performing a lot better as an adult than I did in fact perform as an adult after, you know, eight years of, you know, of just like a hiatus from, from you know endurance sports and so i i just felt like there's got to be more than this like I, I i thought i was better at this stuff um and just i think a lot of stuff had to come together it wasn't all just mental i i had to figure i was injury prone so i had to find ways to stay healthy um i just you know maybe because I, I was a gym rat for a while i, I was like uh, you know, i bulked up i had a, like a lot of useless upper body muscle i think it just took a long time to sort of really kind of transform my body back into the ectomorph I was meant to be. Uh, so a lot of factors. Yeah. I'm still fighting against the ectomorph. I'm, meant to be. <laughs> I'm desperately trying. Um, you like the reason I was asking about that is because I think we're in agreement that maybe a useful way to focus on getting the best tangible result is to focus on the effort that you're putting in and the subjective experience, like how hard can I work? Cause you're only, fighting against yourself in this capacity you're only working with yourself um how have you seen that show up that kind of we call it effort over outcome um but like how have you seen that kind of that focus show up in your life and the lives of athletes that you've coached and researched and that kind of thing yeah i mean uh, i've become a big believer in that you know kind of process focus orientation i mean you know, goals are kind of a double-edged sword. Like you have to have them. Um, and there's plenty of research showing that, you know, if you set um, relevant, challenging, measurable, achievable goals, you're likely to perform better than you will without them. But, you know, as a coach now, I, I, I say to athletes I work with often, like the, the purpose of goals is not to achieve them. The purpose of goals is to help you find your limit. Um, and, and so it's really immaterial whether you, it, it's, it's nice when you achieve a goal, don't get me wrong, but if you discover your limit in the process of falling short of a goal, uh, you know, there are plenty of examples of household name champion legendary athletes who, you know, their, their favorite race they ever did is a race they lost because they were, they went they stretch themselves further than, than they ever had. Like that's a champion's mindset. And you see that over and over and over again. It's funny. A lot of recreational athletes are like, no, they, they're just saying that because it sounds good. No, <laughs> like that's really what, what greatness is all about. It's just like, you, you'd rather be up against the best competition and lose fair and square and be stretched beyond where you could ever go winning easily. Um, and I think that's really true. You know, I've, I've done, a, you know, I've, run, I've run more than 50 marathons. I've done, you know, all kinds of other races, triathlons of every, every distance. So I have a wealth of, of experience and, you know, I can look back and say, for sure, my most satisfying races are the ones that were the hardest, you know, where I, I did not blink and I, I found something new inside myself. Um, and yes, if you can win on top of that, it's great.
yeah it's almost like goals form this like one part of the hierarchy in terms of like a piaget developmental model it's like okay they form this kind of like segment and that segment forms like this overall arching vision of like this is who i want to become and like what i consider like a good person and then down there it's like and then as further you get down towards the actual practical this is what i'm doing today it reverts back to that okay i'm going to focus on the effort rather than the outcome i'm going to focus on my input what i can control um a big part of this is like perceived effort and you you write about perceived effort and and like Let's let's start off with like what is perceived effort and, and why is it important for an athlete to understand? Yeah, perceived effort is it, it's it is a perception, um, just like other perceptions we have. Um, uh, so I mean, you know, if you feel cold or hot, you know, that that's a perception. So perceived effort is just distinct from from pain and other things. You know, if you if you're doing any type of exertion, whether it's exercise or chopping wood or whatever. You know, if if I ask you how hard are you working right now, you can easily answer. You know, and that is is your perception of effort. And um, you know, thanks to brain imaging, uh, we're able to see like what's going on inside the brain that produces that perception. Um, and you know, sure enough, it's not the same as as pain or feeling cold or or hot. Um, so it's your sort of it's your global sense of how hard you're working at, at a given moment relative to your limit. And why is it so important for an athlete to understand what this is? Um, it, it's important because it actually is your performance limit. So, um, you know, we have physical limits, obviously, right? <laughs> um, you know, you can't just jump off a building and fly because you believe, <laughs> believe you can. So, um, you know, you know, especially, you know, it, it's, it's simplifying to look at the endurance context just because it's so simple. Um, so, you know, like if you're running a marathon or, or whatever, uh, no matter who you are, you will you, like your, your, your performance in that race will not be uh, limited by your physical capabilities. Like th there will be no actual, like you won't, you know, you won't completely run out of muscle glycogen or you won't receive, you won't achieve a level of muscular acidosis that truly should stop you in your tracks. Um, so what's happening is like, you know, as, as, as you push through a race and as fatigue accumulates, you're moving mo mo closer and closer to your physical limits. But th at the same time, your perception of effort is increasing because perception of effort is really a feed forward thing. It, it's, it's a function of how hard your brain is working to drive your muscles. So if you're trying to say, let's say your marathon pace is six minutes per mile, um, you know, your first six minute mile feels quite easy because you're not fatigued. But as you approach your physical limits, that same pace is going to feel harder and harder and harder. And what ultimately stops you from going any faster or any farther is that you reach a limit of your perceived effort tolerance. Like you just simply cannot tolerate, you know, it, like any more intense suffering than you're currently experience, experiencing. So, you know, people tend to think of uh, psychological limits as somehow like less real than physical limits. But, you know, it, when, when people, when I'm addressing someone who has that type of skepticism, I point out that there are actually ways of experimentally inducing pain that cause no physical harm, but everyone has a limit. Like everyone has a limit for pain tolerance, even if no harm is being done to your body. And it's the same thing with perceived effort tolerance. So physical limits constrain performance, but the direct limiter is, uh, is psychological. And, any, and anything that like is anything you can only, you can, like a hundred meter sprint, that's not the case. You, those are your physical limits, but anything that's sustained, uh, you hit a, a, a physical limit before, no, sorry, a psychological limit before a physical limit. Yeah. And I think the important thing to remember there is that your subjective experience is your only version of reality. So a part of that is your psychology, a part of that is your mentality and your emotional state and your mental state, like everything you feel like that is your personal reality. So that like that's indistinguishable from your physical reality is and it's, it's that growth of that that creates mental growth that creates change um how are you changing or how are you teaching athletes or how do you go about um educating athletes about their own perceived effort tolerance and how to expand that yeah i mean there there, there are all kinds of ways to come at it um you know just you know explaining the science doesn't hurt you know what i mean uh just so that i think that 
um, the way forward, you know, truth is always the, the way forward. So I, I, I like educating athletes about these concepts, um, you know, because it's going to be helpful, if not now, then down the road. Because, you know, I was always one of these people, well, I, mean, I think this is just generally understood that if you, the more you, you sort of buy into your training, the more effective it's going to be. So, you know, the, the same training gets better if you really understand it and view it as, as kind of a secret sauce. So, uh, you know, a big part of my approach to coaching is just that, like getting athletes, not just to do what I tell them to do, but to understand their training um, and, and, and to really believe in it. Um, so, you know, where, where perceived effort is concerned, um, you know, the, there are sort of two, I guess, two main approaches to it. One is increasing your tolerance, you know, you know, psychological limits, as I said, are every bit as real as physical limits, but they are more mutable. They're, they're, they're like, take something like, uh, like anger. Anger is performance enhancing for, in a lot of circumstances. And, and why is it? Because it increases your, your pain tolerance, your perceived effort tolerance. Um, experience is another one. Um, you know, motivation is, is another one. So there are all these, all these levers you can pull to increase your, just basically increase your, your maximum tolerance for the suffering you're going to have to endure to get where you want to go. So what seemed like your limit, you know, a week ago might not be your limit anymore if you've got more experience or more motivation or, or what have you. So that, that's part of it. Um, and then another was, uh, it, uh, you know, another, the, the second major sort of approach is that you can reduce the, the, uh, you can reduce the effort you experience at any given level of output in a variety of ways. Like that's basically how physical training works. Like, you know, you could start off, you know, when an eight minute mile feels like an eight out of 10 effort. And after eight weeks, an eight minute mile feels like a five out of 10 effort. And for that reason, you can run a hell of a lot more eight, eight minute miles. You know, if you know, it's just so you can, you can change the relationship between your actual phys objective physical output and the effort level you, you perceived. And that's how caffeine works. Like you take caffeine before exercise, it makes any given level of physical output feel easier. And therefore you can either go harder or go longer at the same intensity. I didn't know that's how caffeine works. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, and yeah. actually it, there, there's more than one mechanism. So that's not, you know, caffeine will also help you if you're a power lifter. Uh, oh nothing to do like that's a completely yeah. neuromuscular mechanism but yeah for any like any type of endurance thing yeah that's interesting like you almost like described a, essentially a model of exposure therapy like the more you meet that 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 tolerance or meet that discomfort the more you kind of learn that okay i'm i'm essentially safe this is fine like i'm i'm strong within this and i can handle this and i'm good enough whereas when you're just dabbling it and you only meet it in a competition or you meet it at a meet or you, you you only rarely encounter it that's when you're like oh shit what's this like i didn't mean to like right. I, don't, I don't like <laughs> this whereas if it becomes part of your daily life and you embrace it through other things like cold showers other forms of discomfort even practicing meditation that kind of thing it becomes like oh okay i'm, I'm aware of this and i know i can tolerate with tolerate it um you spoke about i think this this almost like a trade-off between okay am i pushing away discomfort am i getting rid of it and also or am i like accepting it can you talk a little bit about like the difference between those two and how they affect athletes yeah um you know there's this great quote from the uh former american record holder for the 5,000 meters guy named bob kennedy um, I have to paraphrase, but he said, you know, the thing you have to accept right up front is that racing hurts. If you can't, you're not going anywhere. Um, and that's just it. Like, and there's, you know, a lot of research on this concept of acceptance. Um, uh, you know, I, I like to stress that pain is not the same thing as perceived effort, but they're parallel enough that, you know, a lot of the pain research definitely is applicable, uh, to matters of, of perceived effort. And what, what certain pain research has shown is that um, if you if you sort of mentally brace yourself for a mental uh, for a painful stimulus, you 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 kind of accept this is going to hurt, but I know I can handle it. I've gotten through it before. Your pain tolerance will actually be higher than if you go into a painful stimulus thinking, I hope this doesn't hurt, or like maybe it won't be as bad as it was last time. So 
So there's a lot you can do in just how you prep for, you know, if, if it's very likely to be hard, you might as well just accept <laughs> it's going to be hard because then there are no unpleasant surprises, right? If it ends up being hard, you're like, well, I knew it was going to be hard. Um, and yeah, there's, there's one really cool study I'd love to cite. Um, it's just mind blowing, honestly. Um, uh, it was a researcher named Elena Ivanova, uh, um, Canadian. Um, and uh, she did the study with sedentary women. So women do, who did, like, did not exercise at all. And she put them on stationary bikes and had them do a high, high intensity ride to exhaustion. So that's a you know, type of the protocol is you're at a fixed high intensity and you just go until you file, fall off the bike, basically. It's, it's like an open loop, uh, no predetermined endpoint. So she had all these people do this test. And of course it sucked. And you, know, you have to think if these are sedentary people, they probably don't like those types of sensations to begin with. And then she separated them in, into two groups one group, they watch documentary videos or whatever like the control is for psychological interventions. And then the other half received a single training, what's known as acceptance and commitment therapy. And it's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy that's all about training people to just accept, you know, you know, the, the unpleasant parts of pursuing any kind of meaningful goal. Um, and after one training, you know, obviously, you know where this is going, you know, the women came back, sat on the stationary bikes again, did the same protocol again. And of course, you know, the controls who had done just watched documentary videos or whatever, there was no improvement. But the, the women who gotten this training in acceptance and commitment therapy, I think they, they stayed on the bikes 15% longer. It's huge so amount. yeah, it's a huge amount. And there was no physical exercise involved. Like they, they did not train, they did not get fitter. And it just go. It, I love I love that study because it shows you it quantifies the mental contribution to physical performance. Like these these people were out of shape. They did, they did not get in shape. That's not the reason they performed better. They just they they changed what was going on inside their heads while they were experiencing the discomfort that comes along with intense exercise. Yeah, and did it in one session. That's one. the phenomenal thing. Like that's no yes. that's almost no training to overcome a lifetime's worth of patterning. That's nothing. Right. And that's, yes. that's incredible. And um, what are some, like we've spoken about, like the kind of the useful sides of this, the, the useful tactics, what are some maladaptive or like unuseful mechanisms that people use to kind of, uh, to try to reduce their perceived effort? Yeah, I mean, um, disassociation, you know, the research is mixed there. It shows that it's sometimes beneficial for some people, but definitely not for competitive people so just like you know trying to pretend it's not happening or distract yourself or you know kind of ignore what you're experiencing that tends to be maladaptive it's it's understandable right you know if you're if you're you know suffering intensely in pursuit of of some athletic goal um you, you know because like if you just i mean athletic psychology is human psychology. So you, you use the same toolkit, right? So there are all kinds of situ situations in life where if you're exposed to a nox noxious stimulus, you'd be an idiot not to walk away from it, right? So we know, we, we understand that, you know, escape is sometimes just a sane and viable solution. And so, you know, but in the athletic context, when um, it's just, you know, it's all about deferred gratification, right? You have to, you have to put up with an ordeal now in order to, for a payoff down the road. Uh, and, and in that particular setup, um, you know, the thing that might be useful when it's just a nuisance that's, that's not attached to any major goal in everyday life, suddenly you have to kind of use a different tool for, from your toolkit and you don't want to walk away from the discomfort you're feeling. You want to accept it. It's not like you try to convince yourself you like it, but you just, you view it as like, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you got to break a few eggs. It's like, this is part of the process. And I accept that. Yeah. It's interesting. You said how it works for individuals. Cause like one of the less enjoyable things I've done is a 30 mile load carry, uh, like across Dartmoor, mm -hmm. but like it's, it's, it's like not exactly comfortable it's especially after like two weeks in the field and like that's like a, a final test a big culminative test that people like consider like a huge thing people in the same section as me doing the same task as me their strategy 
was to dismantle an engine in his, in his head and like so he'd just picture it and he did that for eight hours with like 15 kilos on his back or whatever like and he just he did that whereas mine i just like i if i started distracting myself i started falling off the pace and i could feel myself dragging back the only right. way i could do it's yep. like completely hone in okay this is what i'm doing this is what i'm here to do um and and i suppose in that situation being an ultra realist it, it would being as best as the as close as I could possibly come to it at that point. Um, so, yeah, it's fascinating that individual part. Of it. We both completed the same test, both did the same thing, but um, both like got successful. But it's interesting that there's different elements to it. Um, I just mentioned the phrase ultra-realist. What does it mean to be an ultra-realist? Yes, it's a, it's a term of my coinage, I'm proud to say. Um, and, yeah, so... You know, I, I'm not a psychologist. You know, I don't have any training in that field. But you know, as I mentioned, I, I've been fascinated by it uh, since that uh, you know four lap race around the soccer pitch when I was ten or eleven years old. And you know, the, it, so it's just an abiding interest. You know, it's deeply personal for me because, as I said, I became a head case. It ruined the sport for me at one point, and then by working on it, I made like a really kind of astonishing transformation uh, to, you know, I, I got to the point in my mental fitness development where I, I was completely unafraid of everything. Like, uh, just like, like, in fact, the very same suffering that I used to recoil from, I started to crave, like, like I liked it and it wasn't masochistic. It was just like, I had gotten to the point where it, I, I felt I was so damn good at it and so much better that it was a competitive advantage. Like, so I couldn't wait. And I, I've talked to other athletes who that's their mentality. Like they salivate when mm -hmm. it gets hard because they know like, this is where I shine. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm not, I sound like I'm chest thumping here, but, but my whole point is that like, this is possible. You know, you can start off as a mental weakling and become a mental giant by working at it. Um, and, you know, as a coach, you know, just, you know, I, my job is to try and, help athletes achieve their goals, goals and improve. So, you know, respecting the mental dimension of the sport as much as I do, you know, I actively work on that with athletes. Um, but so I've done my share of reading um, and, you know, I, I you know, I, I have my own podcast, like, um, you know, I have sports psychologists on all the time. So, I, you know, I, I absorb a lot of learning, but I've always felt that um, I kind of have my own shtick. Sometimes it's an advantage not to like, be schooled in a particular subject because it allows you to kind of kind of come up with your own concepts and and for me what I found both in my own athletic journey and in working one-on-one -on -one with athletes is that um you know the the thing that you see you know the people who have the strongest mental game there's one thing that they're always doing which is fully embracing the al the reality that they're confronted with um, and, and so that's the magic, like that's the goal, like that's where you want to get to. Everything else is just details, like that, that's my belief. So ultra realist is just a term for that type of person, like a person who, you know, either by nature or nurture or both, like that's their reflex. Like, you know, if they're in the, in the middle of a race and something goes horribly wrong, everyone has that first moment where they're like, oh shit, like I didn't want this to happen. But whereas like, you know, maybe nine out of 10 athletes kind of get stuck there, you know, they continue to wish it hadn't happened or, you know, they can, they start hoping for some kind of miracle rescue. That's all about not, not accepting the reality. Like what the champions do is they very quickly pivot from, oh shit, I, I wish this hadn't happened to, okay, how do I make the best of this? Um, so that, that's an ultra realist in a nutshell. Yeah, it's fascinating that the, yeah, the, the, just the fact of, okay, I'm dealing with reality itself. Like I'm dealing with, that's what I'm dealing with. And the more inaccurate my representation of reality, the less accurate my response can be. Like, because I can't make an accurate response. Um, so it follows the, the more accurate, the more truthful we can be the more truthful our response and then the better we can deal with it um can you talk to me about the three stages of dealing with reality yeah so yeah it, it's kind of like you know like um 
Yes, F like fully facing the reality you're confronted of, confronted with is the project, but it's a project that has three components to it. You can sequence them, but they often happen all at once. Um, the first is acceptance. Um, and that's just where you sort of, you, you recognize the reality you're facing as the truth, like whether you like it or not. Um, and, and that can be a hard, that, even that first hurdle can be a hard one for people to clear, um, be, you know, for obvious reasons, right? Like, like you just, you, 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 you wish it hadn't happened. It, it's hard, it's difficult to face. It, 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 it's an especially difficult hurdle to hear, to, to clear when the reality you're facing reflects badly on you where like you've had a weakness exposed like we do not like seeing that and sometimes we'll just plug our ears and go na 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 <laughs> like a little kid so that but you've got to get there before you can um you know you know get any further and so the second step is after you've accepted the reality you embrace it and again embracing embracing a challenging reality does not mean you try to convince yourself you're happy it, it happened it just means that you make the commitment to make to make the best of it. So acceptance is all right. Life has handed me lemons. Um, embracing the reality is let's see what I can do with these lemons. Um, and then if you get past that hurdle, and again, many athletes don't, depending on on exactly what's going wrong. Uh, the final hurdle is um, making uh, is uh, what is it? Acceptance or embracing. Interesting and addressing the reality. And, and, and that's when you actually turn those lemons into lemonade. Um, and there are really two elements to, to that, like to, to actually, you know, to fulfill your commitment to make the best of the situation. Um, it requires effort, right? And, and that's the one that everyone recognizes. Like, you know, when you see an athlete pull off an amazing comeback where they overcome adversity, we tend to credit the, the effort you know, that, that kind of never say die toughness, but, and which is important, but just as important. And in the examples I give in my book, I, I, I try to emphasize that just as important as being smart. Actually, uh, judgment is a huge part of it because often like the, the people who are sort of, you know, toughness can be a kind of laziness where you want toughness to be the solution to everything. It's like, oh, you know, it's, it's hard, but it's also simple because it's only one thing. But very, very often when, when athletes suffer a major setback, um, toughness is kind of baked in. Yes, of course you have to be tough, but like, like they're often like a series of um, not easy decisions that, that in judgment calls that have to be made. Sometimes restraint um, is what gets you to the finish line. Um, and so, yeah, embracing, I'm sorry, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm tripping at the yeah, last hurdle, addressing, addressing, <laughs> addressing reality. Yeah, it's both about effort and about judgment. Yeah, like the truth is nuanced, right? Like it's yes. it's never going to require just one simple simplistic solution. Otherwise, everyone would do that the whole time. And one exactly. of the things that we encounter a lot when working with athletes is their ability to deal with bad breaks and unfortunate events that have gone. Well, it's depending on how you phrase it. Maybe they're not unfortunate. Maybe they're exactly what we needed. Um, but dealing with things that were running up against our initial goals in some way what mistakes do you find athletes typically making when they are um, dealing with the bad breaks what do you see time and time again yeah it's uh rewinding to that first hurdle like a lot of athletes they they have trouble accepting it like they um you know they become very problem focused versus solution focused like you you can get into self-pity you know the, the why why me mentality um, catastrophizing is what psychologists, you know, call it when you kind of turn a, a molehill into a mountain in your mind, just like not, not getting over it, like not accepting it and just, and just moving on. Um, you know, that, I think that honestly, that that's the biggest one in, in the bad break scenarios. Um, yeah, it seems like accepting is maybe the hardest one to do because you've got such a selection bias for what you're going to pay attention to like the the um you must have seen that monkey business video where the uh you're told to pass how many uh count how many times the the players pass the basketball between each other and at one point a gorilla walks into the screen beats right chest. right right and you don't you don't realize because your entire narrative is set up around okay count how many times they're passing the ball 
count right. how many times they're doing this. And like, so you filter out everything else. And if your entire life and environment and evolution, everything that influences us to create our beliefs is, is directing you like, don't see this thing because it's uncomfortable. It takes a lot of kind of walking around the subject and, and questioning from other people maybe to help you see that. Um, have you found any useful strategies for helping people uh, like accept reality as it is? Yeah, I mean, you know, often I, I use a technique I call benign shaming, <laughs> which is like, I'll, I'll, and it's actually, a, it's a big part of what I do with myself when I write, when I write a book like The Comeback Quotient, and I give all these examples of great athletes um, overcoming tremendous adversity to achieve something great. I'm kind of like shaming myself. It's like the, the what's your excuse thing, mm -hmm. you know, because all you need is one example of someone who, you know, you know, doesn't throw a pity party when, so when something goes wrong and, you know, goes on to, you know, maybe they're still not able to achieve their original goal, but they're proud of themselves afterwards for, for how they handled it. All it takes is one example to show like, why don't you just also do that? Um, so that's what I'll do often when I, when I have, when I'm working with an athlete who is struggling to accept, um, a bad break. Also, you know, there's a kind of a nuance, uh, in those circumstances, there's a nuanced difference between, um, acceptance and embracing. So there are, there are a lot of athletes who actually do accept the reality that something has gone wrong, but then what they, they can't embrace it and embracing it in those situations really means, um, you'll hear athletes say, well, what's the point? You know, like, you know, you know, because of what happened, I'm not going to be as fit as I wanted to be when I start the race or because of something that happened during the race, I'm not going to be able to hit the time I, I had my heart set on. So those people have actually accepted it. Like they, 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 you know, just cognitively, they accept the reality that something's gone wrong, but they, they can't embrace it. It's like, it's all or nothing. It's like either my original goal or, what's the point? And what I try to explain to, to those athletes is actually nothing has changed. Like your goal going in was not the goal. Your goal was to like run the best race you're, you're capable of whatever happens. And so what I, you know, one of the things I just try and train athletes in, like I, I have a, an athlete racing in, in France today doing a, a trail uh, ultra marathon. And the kind of thing I will, I will say in sort of my last pep talk before um, a race, it's like, hey, listen, shit's gonna go wrong in the race. Like, there's a very, very good, like what you signed up for is not easy. Like the goal that you're trying to achieve is not a lock. So if you get to a, you know, a moment in, in the race, or it could even be in training, um, when you're sort of surprised by a setback or things are harder than you expected, you knew that was a possibility. So like, like, like sort of if you're prepared for anything, um, it, it's like, well, that's unfortunate, but like nothing's changed. Like, you know, like I'm on the same path I was on before that random setback occurred. Yeah. Um, whilst you're talking about benign shaming, there's, um, a story that came to mind with Emily Rolfe, who is a CrossFitter that I interviewed yesterday and CrossFit games, like usually a five ish day competition. First day this year for her was a, a one mile swim with fins and a three mile kayak back. Um, and then there's a few other events. And then that night she picked up, I think it was E. coli from the water. Oh, wow. So 2 a.m., losing it from both ends, an awful experience. And like at that point, she's got a phenomenal mindset and she works the mental coach, but like he had no idea what was going on. She was just like, fearful but quite like okay i'm pragmatic about it and her coach pointed out um i think it was lebron james who had a very similar thing before one of the biggest games of his life and um the suspicion is that he was like someone dosed him or food poisoned him and he played one of the best games that he had ever played so like having that oh if it's fine for them like she even said those excuses like those words what's my excuse what am I doing? Like, because like, if it's possible for him, it's possible for me. Um, so it's really interesting to hear your kind of your take on that. And we're feeding into the same truths. And the more we reinforce those, the easier it is for people. Um, talking about 
the kind of conversations you have with athletes. Some athletes are more open to training their mentality than others. What are you doing to have those conversations or to increase people's openness to their mental aspects and mental um, experience um, who are are not as open to these kind of conversations? Yeah, I have an advantage in, um, you know, not every coach is an author (laughs) as well. So, um, you know, the people who come to me for coaching know exactly what I'm all about. So Mm -hmm. I I don't like, there's a self-selection, like I don't get athletes who aren't open to working on uh, their mental game. But even if, if that weren't the case, they would find out on day one uh, that like, you know, I, I have, I, I sort of enjoy, you know, I, I because I'm busy, I, I strictly limit the number of one-on-one athletes I work with at any given time. Uh, and what's nice about that is you, you develop long-term relationships. Like the first year is just preparatory in any coach athlete yeah. relationship. You can really make some strides after the first year once you really get to know them but that being said one of the things I enjoy about working with new athletes and when I bring someone on is like the shock that I can see registering when they realize they realize like what they thought coaching was is not (laughs) what I do like I I don't like micro analyze like the data from workouts unless something's wrong and there's a justification for it but um from day one, like I'll get pretty personal with them. Like I'll, like I'll, I will sort of model things that I, that I think are okay for them. Uh, like if I, the example I always like to give is like, if I forget to do something for an athlete, instead of like making up a little fib to cover for myself, I'll just own it like straight out. And what I'm doing there is letting them know, guess what? Like the truth is always okay. Like in this environment, like it, it's just showing that like, even like little realities that are easy to gloss over and not accept, like, nope, we're, we're not doing that. We're not allowing ourselves anything. So like, I remember one athlete, when I started working with him, he, I gave him a long run to do. I think it was like a nine mile run and no, 11 mile run. And, and at nine miles, he blew up and he had to walk. Um, and then he ended up kind of recovering and, and running the last part. And he said to me afterward, um, well, you know, at least it was like a 10 and a half mile run because that was the total amount of running he did. And I said, no, it was a nine mile run. <laughs> That's where you blew up. And just like, and I could tell he's like, gosh, what a hard ass. But, but I think you know, over time he came to appreciate that just like we're going to look squarely at reality in all circumstances. I'm like, I'm not going to let you get away with anything. And also I'm not going to let myself get away with anything. And, and we'll both hold ourselves to that very high standard um and uh we'll get places that way how do you view optimism and pessimism yeah interesting so i'm naturally not an optimist Uh, like i I, i'm um you know psychologists use the term defensive pessimism where it's just sort of like you expect the worst or whatever Mm -hmm. you know um and and what's interesting I, i just wrote a blog post about this not long ago how you know, optimism actually can be maladaptive in a lot of circumstances that, you know, the Pollyanna-ish type of thing, like nothing to see here. Well, if there is something to see here, then don't say that, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, optimistic can be a way, optimism can be a way of actually denying reality. Um, uh, there, actually, there was a, a famous case of um, a, a U.S. Army soldier who was a POW, uh, prisoner of war in Vietnam. You know, he was tortured. He was incarcerated for five years. Five years, imagine that, like, yeah. like of being tortured. Um, and when, uh, when he, he eventually did make, make it home and he said, um, he was asked like, like, cause you know, a lot of people broke under, under, you know, as you can imagine, like, you know, they just broke down mentally, psychologically and others didn't. And he was one who didn't. And they asked him, you know, what was the difference? He said, Oh, the optimists were the first to go because they would tell themselves, we'll be home by Christmas. And then they weren't home by Christmas. And then they would tell themselves, I'll be home by my birthday. And then they weren't home by their birthday. And so it was like the defensive pessimists were the ones who just, they had no expectations. They're like, Mm -hmm. all I know is that I'm still a POW today. So I'm just going to put everything I've got into getting through today rather than telling myself some happy story that may turn out to be true or may not. 
Yeah. And even beyond that, when things get really tough, it's not about today. It's about this precise moment. Like something you learn through meditation is that like, okay, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. My legs starting to go numb or whatever, or like in, in, in any training session, I'm feeling this discomfort. And it's like, the fear is like, oh, I can't handle this. But the truth is that you're handling it at that time. So you're right. obviously capable. It's the fear of what's coming right. that is limiting you and is causing you to stop. So it's like, again, coming back to this moment, this this exact moment and not a second before and after. Um, I can't remember the the name of that um, that military veteran. It's, it's bugging me now. So. Yeah. Um, it's somewhere in my head. Stockdale Paradox. Stockdale. 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 Yeah, Stockdale. Stockdale, yeah. Yeah, fascinating book, yeah. fascinating guy. Tip of my tongue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's go for one more before I move on to a few kind of rapid fire questions. What stories stand out to you from the comeback quotient? You know, the one I keep coming back to. Um, so, you know, so currently I I'm suffering from what's called post acute COVID 19 syndrome, which is like a chronic illness that a certain percentage of people who get have COVID end up with. And there's no cure and it may or may not be lifelong. So I actually can't train right now. Like the last time I tried to run a mile, I literally could not get out of bed the next day. So I'm in this situation where it's funny because right when this book came out, is, um, when I got COVID and I actually recovered just fine. And then suddenly like some weird stuff go, started going wrong with my health. Like my heart weight rate was all erratic and I would like get winded just like when, you know, you know just walking or, or whatever. And um, I would have like numbness and tingling in my extremities and like a just whole weird mix of, of uh, symptoms. And eventually I figured out um, that it was this long COVID thing. And like, I'm, almost 11 months into this journey now and just there's no treatments there's no nothing and and it's funny so like the, you know this book comes out where i'm basically telling people how to think <laughs> uh and you know to um uh in order to like just come you know come back from setbacks you know not just in sports but in life as well and you know in a lot of the examples i give in the book are I made a I made a point of giving examples of athlete athletes who had something go wrong in their life outside of sport that affected their sport just to to make the point that it's kind of one and the same. And so uh yeah, the, the athlete uh I, I keep coming back to the most is Jamie Whitmore, um, the world champion off-road triathlete who developed a rare form of cancer. And in, in removing the tumors, they remove like a bunch of her body parts as well. Um, so it's like she has no either left or right buttock. Um, and, and, the, and she ended up coming back, you know, spoiler alert, and uh, earning a Paralympic gold medal in cycling. Um, you know, but, but, you know, she's a challenge that like it's, it's a weird case where she was a world champion, able bodied athlete, and then became a Paralympic champion, uh, disabled athlete. And she just went through the ringer. It's like, that chapter is actually tough sledding. It's hard to read. Like when you read like what remember, she went yeah. through. Yeah. So I think about her a lot. It's just, again, that benign shaming thing. But yeah, I find myself kind of in a similar boat where like I, I have there's something very wrong with my health that is, has also just decimated my athletic journey. Um, so, you know, that's part of what these stories are for. It's just honestly, that's just like it's something to lean on uh, yeah. when, when you're going through it. It shifts your perspective, right? Like yes. when you're just like, oh man, that's what I like. If they're capable of this, that's what I'm like. I'm capable of dealing with my illness wherever I am right now. If if they can get around with, in that situation, it's just it shows you what humans can do and how resilient right. we are and how capable we are. How do you on a kind of <laughs> a massive segue? How do you view fun training? Um, or oh, sorry, fun and joy in training. Oh, it's a huge priority for, for me. Um, you know, um, I mean, it's just a fact, you know, it's, you know, there's interesting research showing that enjoyment is performance enhancing and it just makes sense. Right. Um, I mean, this is kind of false dichotomy out there, especially for people who, um, you know, just don't really enjoy the endurance type exercise that you can either work hard or you can enjoy yourself. But like the, the harder you work, the less you enjoy yourself. And the more you enjoy yourself, the harder you're, the, the less hard you're working. But that's, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. Like um, you know, you'll never work harder than when you're having a blast 
work, working hard. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, 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 I place a premium on it. Um, you know, it just, it, you know, there's an athlete I'm, I'm working with right now who is, um, he's a triathlete, but he has a, a problem with his foot. He had to get some injections and he can't do any running right now. And he's had to like pull out of a couple of races he had coming up. And when we talk, we, you know, we communicate daily, but we have a weekly kind of video consultation and I'll, I'll ask him like, how do we keep your motivation up? Like, I, like, I know, I know, I know what we need to do physically, you know, to maintain fitness and make the best of this and, and set you up for, um, you know, some satisfying races down the road. But in the meantime, like there's, we could do this or we could do that, or we could do something in between. And I want you to pick the one that you will most enjoy uh, because I know that that will keep him engaged um, and give him better results. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a huge point of emphasis, uh, you know, with all the athletes I work with. Yeah. Some people mistake that delayed gratification for this has to suck and I have to hate every moment of it. And they are almost trading their mental health for their success and they completely miss what success actually was for them in the, in the beginning. Uh, it's a, yeah. in all areas of life in all areas of life. What was the greatest athletic performance of, of your life? Boy, um, you know, I, I, I could give more than one answer to that question, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick one. Um, so I mentioned that I got COVID. I got it early on, actually. Um, I was in Atlanta for the Olympic trials marathon. And so I watched the Olympic trials. This is late February, early March, 2020. Oh, real um, OG. You got it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. Pioneer. Um, <laughs> So I actually, I ran a marathon. So I, I wasn't in the Olympic trials, uh, but I watched the Olympic trials and then ran a marathon the next day. And then some, somewhere in there, picked up COVID, went home to California, got sick, um, was sick for a month. And then, um, so when, when I recovered from it, like I had never lost more fitness so quickly in my entire life. And my attitude was like, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> like I wanted to, I, I decided to sign up for a virtual marathon that was six and a half weeks after the day when I first started running again, you know, so I was able to shuffle around my block a little bit. I'm like, I'm going to sign up for a virtual marathon in six and a half weeks after a month of, of no training. But I just wanted to see, cause I was so experienced and so knowledgeable. I just wanted to not be an idiot, not just put myself into a meat grinder, but see like what was possible. Um, and, you know, for me, you know, at that, at that point, I'd run more than 50 marathons, but my first few marathons were disastrous. Like, I, I, it, it was a tough nut to crack for me. It, I had to keep coming back to it before I had attained mastery. Um, and so I wanted to just, like, prove my mastery in this way, just by kind of setting myself up for it, kind of a, a seemingly impossible challenge. Um, and I ended up, I ended up running... A, two hours and 54 minutes or, or something on, you know, I was 48, about to turn 49 years old, uh, six and a half weeks of training. Um, and like, I just, I just nailed it. Like I absolutely, like when I started that, that race, I, I still had the vaguest idea of what I was capable of, but I knew I could figure it out. I just, I, I knew my body I had so much to fall back on. And I absolutely just absolutely nailed the execution of that workout. So it was by far not the fastest marathon I've ever run, but it was just deeply, deeply satisfying because I had just invested so much to attain that level of mastery. And then, you know, just to be able to do something that I know very, very few people could have done in my place was just like, I gave myself a great big pat on the back for that one. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can, that's a huge <laughs> achievement. What did your mental state feel like at that point? Yeah, it was just, um, yeah, I just felt like, um, like I owned it. Like, I, like, I, I, like I, I remember, so I, I was listening, I, I made a special marathon mix, like, you know, like music um, to just kind of like, you know, psych up music to listen while I was doing it. And I remember when I was, you know, it was like, you know, fighting with an arm tied behind my back. Like I knew I wasn't physically what, what I would normally be, but like, but that was part of the fun for me. And I just remember like, you know, get when I got into deep enough into the marathon, when it was really starting to hurt, 
I remember just I, my mantra was just like, use the music, Matt. Use the, <laughs> use the music. I became like really, really focused on just almost like communing with the music I was hearing because like, I, I just, I had this instinct that told me like, if you do that, it will give you what you need. And like, it, it's just so great to have that little kind of weird intuition and to trust it and to go with it and it pays off. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's odd. Like I, I gave the music that I had, had chosen to listen to for that race, a ton of the credit mm. <laughs> for, for, for my success. Yeah. It's like you, that, that deep trust and belief that comes like, yeah, I've got this, this confidence, this stability, almost like, yeah, I'm going to like, I've, yeah, I've got this. What does your day or is there anything you do on a daily basis that is, I don't know, anything mindsetty from journaling to meditation to, well, I suppose training is a big part of it. Yeah. Training was a big part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like part of the way I'm wired is that I have, um, I have a very low tolerance for doing stuff I don't feel like doing. Um, and which is great. Uh, it's worked out because like, you know, I, I lost a couple jobs because I refused to do things I didn't feel like doing, but it, 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 it ended up, you know, I'm in a place in my life where all day, every day is pretty much me getting to do things I want to do because I insisted <laughs> I insisted on creating this life for myself. So it's really honestly that like, like, you know, like I wake up in the morning and I look forward to everything in it. And it's a balance. Um, you know, I keep these to-do lists like on my day planner with all these tasks. And if you, if you just look at the, the selection of tasks on my day planner, like it's pretty well-rounded. Like I'm part entrepreneur, part coach, part writer, um, part, you know, armchair scientist. And so it, it's kind of, it, it, it's like, it's that balance. And um, yeah, just like ha having, having, you know, it's like, I, I sometimes call it the art of the day, like create a perfect day, like, you know, envision like the day that you would like to repeat over and over and over. And then, you know, it might take you a lot of days <laughs> to get there. Um, and you wouldn't want a fast forward button anyway, because it's, you know, you know, getting there is half the fun. But yeah, that's kind of my, my formula is it, just like, um, just this, this day that I kind of view as like um, a blank canvas that I can, I get to put on it, whatever I want. Well, it's what you find most meaningful and humans are driven by meaning. So if we can tap into that, then we're on it. Like that, yes. that is, yeah. And also that would be where your zone of expertise and genius is. So final question, um, why 80-20 endurance? Yeah, so 80-20 um, refers to um, kind of an optimal balance of low and high intensity in endurance training. And, um, you know, Anyone who's been an endurance athlete as long as I do knows that the most successful athletes do the vast majority of their training at low intensity, but very, very few recreational endurance athletes do. They, you know, the research shows it's more of a 50-50 thing. And what's interesting is the, the other 50 is not high intensity, it's moderate. <laughs> I call it the, the moderate intensity ruts, just kind of neither here nor there. Um, and what's cool about it is like, if you, if you go back, if you study the historical evolution of training methods in endurance sports, not just running, but cycling, swimming, triathlon, cross-country skiing, rowing, the whole mix. You know, in the early days, it was, they were all over the map, right? Because nobody knew what the hell they were doing. And they just, they tried a bunch of stuff, but there was this kind of convergence that occurred over many decades as, you know, elite endurance athletes, generation upon generation in different disciplines all over the world, slowly figured out what worked you know, retaining what worked and discarding what didn't until, you know, endurance is endurance. Like, yeah, yeah, there are differences between cycling and swimming or whatever, but the underlying physiology is the same. So by the like early 1960s, pretty much everyone was doing this 80-20 at the elite level, this 80-20 endurance um, intensity balance, but no one actually realized it until a um, uh, uh, scientist named uh, Steven Seiler actually said about like rigorously quantifying how elite endurance athletes do balance their intensities. And he discovered like this kind of almost like, almost like uncanny 
consistency because like rowers don't talk to cross-country skiers mm -hmm. but they're actually training the same way and eight generations ago they weren't training the same way so it's just um it's kind of cool um so yeah i just i did not i'm not the guy who invented this in fact nobody did it was just it evolved um but my business is sort of built on that's like our shtick 80 20 endurance that's great yeah it's a principle of life that runs true so where can right. people find out a little bit more about 80 20 endurance get your books uh, follow you on instagram or twitter or in, uh, anywhere that they they could do yeah, my personal website is mattfitzgerald.org. Like there's a books tab on there. I've written all too many books. There's something for everyone, I'm sure. Um, and then my, yeah, my business website, just 8020endurance.com. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, again, I highly recommend Comeback Quoting, especially. We found it incredibly useful. Um, if I take my headphones off for a second. It's right there, easily accessible. Um, right on. It's, yeah, fantastic. We found it this is one of the most highlighted books i have um so yeah we, we find it very very useful and thank you again for an awesome show my pleasure